So I've been working for the last few years um, helping young people manage their mental health. I spend one day a week working in a GP surgery as a counsellor, and I'm a member of the DataMind advisory group. And DataMind is, is trying to make, um, make uh, data around, or pa patient data around mental health available to improve research and improve research and innovation around uh, interventions into, into mental health. And I really do believe that chatbots live, you know, are, are key to um, improving digital health. Oh, wow. So everything you've heard so far has been exclusive, and now, <laughs> and now the world has joined us. <laughs> so I really do believe that chatbots and, and, and conversational AI are important to, to digital health. But not just, not just important, but, but, but critical. And here's why. Waiting lists have increased by 40% since the beginning of the pandemic. And before that, by the way, the target time for young people to get support from CAMS, Children and Adolescent Mental Health Services, was 12 weeks target, by the way, and that's not what they achieved. And all the time, that, and that's if you can get referred, because all the time the threshold for being re referred gets higher, so you have to be more unwell to wait long times to get support. And at a meta level, we know that we're living in a world where there's an aging population living with chronic diseases, adding more, um, adding more burden to the, to, to the health services. So the promise of AI is compelling. We could increase accessibility. We can reduce waiting times. We can improve long-term outcomes, um, not just on the burden in the health service, but importantly, the impacts that poor mental health has on people's lives. So, what do I mean by changing people's lives? Well, in mental health, we really talk about three things. Bio, psycho, and social change. Biological change could be physical. It might be eating better. It might be getting more exercise. It might even be drinking that extra glass of water. Psychological change could be reducing stress, um, the stress that we feel, changing the way that we think. It could be something as simple as changing the tone of voice in which we speak to ourselves. Try that one. It's really effective. Or it could be social change. It could be feeling less anxious in social settings, spending more time with our friends and our family and people who support us. But there's an important thing about change in mental health is that while short-term change is important, it's not as important as having long-term beneficial effects, long-term outcomes on people. So how do we create change? Well, People need a number of things to be able to change. First of all, they need the opportunity. That might be the time to focus on change. It might be the money that allows them the time or to pay for counsellors in order for they could, they could change. And they probably need some support to help them through the change. Some cheerleaders, some friends. They need the capability. Mentally, they have to have some headspace. So someone who's struggling with severe anxiety is unlikely to start running because they simply can't go out of their house. Physically, we need to be ready to change. So people with chronic conditions quite often aren't ready to work on their mental health because their symptoms are so bad. And in social context, it's really important. We need to feel safe to talk about what we're going to change. And here's the thing. Three out of four young people don't talk about mental health issues when they occur. They fear being judged. And of course, we need to feel motivated. We have to believe that change will help us, and we have to believe that we can change. Now, I think that chatbots can help with this. They can, certainly, they can certainly help us create the opportunity. They can enhance our capability, and they should be able to help us be motivated. But how do we know that we're changing people's lives? Well, we could ask how they feel, which is OK. It's a, way, it's, it's a way, right? Um, maybe not particularly repeatable. We can get users to set their own goals and measure how they achieve against those goals, which is quite personalised. We can use psychometric tests like CORE 10 or PHQ9 or any of the others. But they tend to be quite long, so CORE 10 would be 10 questions. And you imagine chatbot. Question, you know, in the last 10 days, how many times have you felt you know, lethargic and tick? 
and another question and another question. So not necessarily very engaging through a chat bot. Also, it's important to understand the context of the person when they're answering these questions. Because if you ask me how I feel at 7 o'clock in the morning, you'll get a slightly grumpier reply than you would if you asked me at 5 o'clock in the evening if I've just been for a run. So measuring at different times and in different contexts is really important. And measuring long-term impacts is really important, but much, much more hard, much, much harder to do. Um, and there's a, the, other, the other way I would think about it is that um, if I'm a clinician, I can probably see about 200 people a year. And most of them I would hope to have an impact on their lives. But if I'm in, involved in public health, I'm, I'm pointing at quite a big constituency. So maybe I'm, in, maybe I'm trying to change 1% of, of, of that constituency. 1% of a million people would be 10,000 people, which is significantly more than a clinician can do. So I think when we think about what chatbots are trying to do, you know, are we trying to emulate a clinician or are we trying to emulate public health? I think at the moment we're much nearer public health, um, but there's, there's certainly room, room to, to move in the other direction. And chatbots should succeed because they're discreet. They can overcome the stigma that people feel. They can give access to expert information that people wouldn't normally get access to. They can be delivered through personalized conversations because they can use personalized data based around the person, but also aggregated data generally to be more specific. And, you know, here's the thing. Imagine, I mean, imagine if a chatbot knew all the data on my phone. I mean, Google do, right? So imagine if a chatbot knows all the activities I've been doing, where I've walked to, who I've messaged, how many times I've messaged. You could probably gauge my mental health. You could probably give me early warning signs about, you know, you know flagging up issues that might be occurring. You could probably give me insights into how my mental health is. And when my phone tells me how many steps I've taken, I mean, why can't it tell me how many positive things I've done about my mental health in a day? But we're quite a long way from this. I mean, arguably, AI just isn't ready. To, it's not up to the task. Trust is really important in changing people's mental health and helping them. And if a conversation fails, it can quickly undermine that trust. You know, and the user's commitment to change, their commitment to the service can disappear quite quickly. And while closed questions may be safer, they're not as engaging. Whereas open ones like, how are you today? Open up us to so many different replies which are difficult to understand and difficult to compute. I think we measure the wrong things. Like acquisition, retention, you know, referrals, downloads, these are really important things. But if we're trying to understand if we're changing people's lives, then we have to measure the impact of what we're having and what impact that has on people. Imagine being able to say, people who use our chatbot have 20% better outcomes than people who don't. Now, I don't care what sector you're in. That's the kind of thing you want to be able to say. And to order to, in order to say that, we have to measure the important things. And I think maybe that as chatbot developers or app developers, we shy away from the difficult things and we go towards the shiny marketing speak. But if we want to change people's lives, we need to do the difficult things. I want to talk to you about a couple of projects now. The first one is Wobot, which many of you may know about. Um, so it's not a chatbot. It's important. It's a, it's a, I'm going to read some of this. It's a relational agent. So they describe, they describe Wobot as, um, through the use of AI and NLP, Wobot forms trusted bonds and delivers clinically validated techniques in an approachable conversational manner. So importantly, it uses techniques like uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, which are evidence-based and widely used around the world, particularly with, 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 with young people. They've got FDA-granted um, breakthrough device designation for the company's digital therapeutic, uh, digital therapeutic for the treatment of postpartum depression. So, I mean, it's interesting. FDA approval, that's quite cool. And they've done some research. 
And amongst the things that the, the research find, this is Wobot have done this research, so it's self-funded, so, it, so it's, not, it's, not, um, it's not neutral, it's not independent. But one of the things they found was that the, the, bond, that, um, the bond that Wobot formed with users appeared to be non-inferior to the bond created between human therapists and patients. So what they're saying is that their chatbot can create emotional relationships with you. Which, if it's true, is amazing. It's like, it's just, I, I get, I'm sort of super excited and completely cynical at the same time. Because on the one hand, that seems amazing, and if it's true, there's hope for us all. Um, I imagine the things that we can do if that's true. But at the same time, I work, I work as a counsellor, and I just, I almost, I, I work as a counsellor, and I build chatbots, and I, I almost can't believe that it could be the same relationship. But listen, it's amazing no matter what, and I'm really looking forward to you know, the information that will come out and, the, and, and, and you know, any further research that they do. As I said, you know, I've been working the last few years working with young people in mental health and really in a co-creation with young people, understanding what they want, understanding you know, their experience of mental health and how they want to be supported. Um, and some of the things that, that, that we understood were first was that young people want to you know, work on their mental health in three minutes. And they want to do it on the way to the shops. You know? And that sounds, you know, I say that and it sounds sort of patronising, but I don't mean it like that. It's a fascinating thing to know. Because once you know that, you can capture them for three minutes, which is what, we've do, we're, what we're doing. We've broken down the conversations we're having with young people into three-minute chunks. So they can deal with us in three minutes, and then six minutes, and then nine minutes, and then 12 minutes. They really worry about the stigma of mental health. They really worry about being judged. They find most of the information that's out there isn't relevant to them. They worry about their privacy. They don't want to see an alert on their phone saying, it's time to check in on your mental health. Because their phone's probably sitting on a table next to their friends or their parents. They don't want these people to know. They like it to be straight talking. They don't want fluffy animals talking to them about their mental health. They want to learn what's going on. They want to be able to find ways to make them feel better. At the moment, we're working with the NHS, capturing clinician data um, and turning it into conversations aimed at young people who are suffering from gastrointestinal uh, functional disorders, but also suffering from mental health issues. And the problem with functional disorders is that you have symptoms, quite unpleasant ones, but you don't have a diagnosable disease, so you can't be treated. You don't get support from the NHS. But so you don't know what's going on with you. You don't know why it's happening. You get anxious. The more anxious you get, the worse you feel. The worse you feel, the more anxious, and on it goes. And so what we're doing is helping those young people to understand their symptoms, but also deal with their mental health issues. So, what's my, what is my conclusion? If we're, going to, if we're going to change people's lives, it's not going to be easy. But here are some of the things we should do. The first one is to focus. Do one thing really well, and do one thing that users care about. So being and connect, understanding the user is the most important thing here. The second is avoid the trap of replacing a human. A chatbot's different. Use those differences to create a better service. We're not trying to replace the clinicians we're working with. We're just trying to extend the reach that they have. Measure what matters. Like pirate metrics are really important, but not as much as biosocial change and not as much as long-term impact. Embrace chatbotiness. I've made up a phrase. Being a chatbot isn't necessarily bad. It allows you to talk in a certain way. It allows you to ask questions that other people wouldn't. It allows you to say things like, hey, I'm only a chatbot, but it sounds like you're really struggling. Is there a human you could talk to? Or can I find one for you to talk to? Be obviously useful. I mean, this it sounds obvious, right? Be obviously useful. Focus on a real problem. Don't offer broad solutions. So... I really think we can change people's lives. But it's not going to be easy. And we have to be willing to do the hard work. But it's got to be worth it, right?